Keown from uh, the Kennedy Institute of Ethics at Georgetown University, a much older Catholic university than this one. Controversial. Um, well, <laughs> and it's my pleasant task to introduce our two speakers uh, today. Um, we're going to start with uh, Professor Diana Sharp from Loyola University, who is a professor of political science at Loyola. She received both her MA and PhD from the University of Chicago. Um, she was the postdoctoral fellow of the program on constitutional government at Harvard. And from 2004 to nine, she was a member of the President's Council on Bioethics. She's taught at the University of Michigan and served as assistant editor of the National Interest. Um, <clears throat> Uh, she earned a, hmm. what did you earn from Kenyon College? <laughs> an AB. An AB, okay, that's fallen off my screen. because We were supposed to have printouts, but that fell through the cracks, so I'm reading from my email. Um, where she was elected to Phi Beta Kappa. It's one of those American things, isn't it? You know, don't know. We don't have those in England. Um, and an MA and PhD from the University of Chicago. And Professor Sharp's going to talk to us on Lincoln Reads the Bible, Science and Morality in the Lecture on Discoveries and Inventions. Thank you. Professor Sharp. on Abraham Lincoln at a conference entitled Higher Powers, it would have been natural to take as my text Lincoln's second inaugural, speech that is not only drenched in Bible references, but that gives a strikingly theological interpretation of the meaning of the Civil War. I could also have discussed the late addition to the Gettysburg Address, in which Lincoln resolves that the nation's new birth of freedom will take place under God. I'm not, however, going to talk about either of those great speeches. Instead, is this still on? It is. OK. Um, instead, I'm going to comment on a much less familiar speech, uh, which just so happens to contain more Bible verses than any speech ever given by Lincoln or any other American politician, for that matter. The speech is the 1859 Lecture on Discoveries and Inventions, a sustained treatment of the meaning and moral dilemma of science. Before hazarding an interpretation, it must be pointed out that we unfortunately don't have the speech in its final form. What we have are two substantial portions, eight to 10 pages each, that were long thought to be separate efforts, the first lecture on discoveries and inventions and the second lecture on discoveries and inventions, but which may in fact be parts of a larger whole. We do know that versions of the speech were delivered multiple times over the two year period from uh, early 1858 uh, to early 1860 during a time of extremely heightened public passions. It was first presented a couple of months before Lincoln's House Divided speech. That's the speech in which he accepted the Republican nomination for the Senate and sketched the contours of the looming sectional crisis. It was presented again a handful of times uh, after his electoral loss to Stephen Douglas in that Senate race. The other activity that kept Lincoln occupied during this time was the preparation of a book-length version of his already famous debates with Douglas. Uh, and as we'll see, the very heart of the lecture on discoveries and inventions is a claim about the effect of the invention of the printing press on the affairs of mankind. The medium of print allows one, Lincoln says, to converse with the unborn at all distances of time and of space. Getting the Lincoln-Douglas debates into print meant that Lincoln's forensic victory over Douglas stood, in his words, a better chance of never being forgotten, whatever might befall the country, even if what happened to the country was the continuation of the Democratic Party's dominance and the nationalization of slavery. Finally, Lincoln delivered the lecture one last time after his tremendous Cooper Union address, which was the speech that fortified his status as a presidential contender in 1860. So it was during this time of intense partisan involvement that Lincoln saw fit to work on what he thought of as his lecture on man. Apparently, this was material that Americans needed to ponder in a wisdom-seeking spirit as the crisis of the House divided gathered steam. 
Now, the first lecture, which I take to be the opening section of the speech, presents a survey of technological advances as gleaned from the Bible. This is no ordinary account of human ingenuity. Let me quote from the opening. All creation is a mine and every man a miner. The whole earth and all within it, upon it, and round about it, including himself, are the infinitely various leads from which man from the first was to dig out his destiny. In the beginning, the mine was unopened and the miner stood naked and knowledgeless upon it. So Lincoln rewrites Genesis, presenting man not in a garden of Eden or even tossed out of the garden to be a tiller of the soil, but instead as a miner, a deep digger engaged in an extractive industrial process. The mining metaphor, which coincidentally was much used by Francis Bacon, suggests that truth is hidden and that nature, even our own nature, does not reveal itself without the application of labor. Lincoln admits that other animals labor too, since they provide themselves with homes and food, but human labor is unique, since man is the only animal who improves his workmanship. Human labor, we might say, is scientific. Lincoln, however, doesn't use an abstract word like science or scientific. His language is more explanatory. He says that this improvement is accomplished by discoveries and inventions. And he gives a memorable illustration of these two operations. Man's first important discovery was the fact that he was naked, and his first invention was the fig leaf apron. From that beginning point, Lincoln traces the scriptural evidence of human industry and its results. He moves from clothing to iron to forms of transport, then agriculture, finally various forces that replace man's own, in, own muscular power, namely animal power, wind power, water power, and steam power. Lincoln quotes from and cites 23 Bible verses tracking such things as the first mention of thread or instruments of iron or chariots. He also references another dozen or so Bible passages without providing chapter and verse. His account draws exclusively from the Old Testament other than a single closing passage from the New Testament. The only New Testament verse, two women shall be grinding at the mill, said to be the language of the Savior, is offered to prove that the water wheel was unknown in Bible times. The verse found in both Matthew and Luke refers to the rapture at the second coming of Christ, while the surrounding verses detail the time of tribulation at the end of days. Thus, the horizon of the first lecture stretches from the creation of the earth to its destruction. As this last instance more than indicates, this is an unorthodox way to employ the Bible. Now, perhaps a pious man turns to the Bible on all occasions, just as a good American turns to Lincoln. But still, this is making the Bible serve a purpose that seems altogether alien to the text. Matthew 24 is about the weeping and gnashing of teeth and Christ's prophecy of his return in power and glory. It is not about when the knowledge of hydropower was acquired. So I think the natural question must be, what the heck is Lincoln doing? I want to suggest that Lincoln is quite aware of what he's doing and that he has carefully selected these Bible references in order to tell two stories simultaneously. The first is a story of technological progress, slow but perceptible. The other is a story of sin, slavery, and divine punishment. Each human invention that is mentioned, beginning with the fig leaf apron, is linked to a tale of disobedience and suffering. Let me give another example. Uh, after telling of the invention of clothing in response to the discovery of nakedness, Lincoln says, the Bible makes no other allusion to clothing before the flood. Soon after the deluge, Noah's two sons covered him with a garment. But of what material the garment was made is not mentioned. <laughs> this, of course, is another story of nakedness and shame. Lincoln doesn't mention the third son of Noah, Ham, who both saw and spoke of the nakedness of his father and whose descendants were said to be cursed with slavery. 
as a result. Well known to Lincoln and his audience was that this Bible story was a staple of pro-slavery apologetics, providing a supposed theological justification for African slavery. This is not the only allusion to slavery. Indeed, the entire assemblage of verses that Lincoln cites could be said to revolve around the sojourn of the Jews in Egypt. The two centuries of Hebrew enslavement with obvious parallels to American slavery forms the subtext of Lincoln's speech. Now, I don't know whether to call Lincoln's two-tiered composition esoteric or not. Uh, it seems to me that Lincoln very much wants his audience to perceive his double inquiry into technological progress on the one hand and on the other moral non-progress, as in the hard-heartedness of Pharaoh. Lincoln can assume, as we today cannot, considerable familiarity with these Bible stories, but he also provides chapter and verse for those who want to be minors of the written word, contrasting his text with his source text. When you follow his leads, you discover another dimension of man's destiny, a political dimension. Lincoln makes repeated reference to one nation, Egypt. The very last topic in the first lecture is steam power. Lincoln points out that the Egyptians understood the principle, for they had a steam-powered toy, the uh, aeola pile. However, they never applied the principle of steam power to useful machinery. He doesn't say so, but one wonders whether in their pride and stubborn reliance on slave power, the Egyptians failed to pursue the liberating potential of technology. Certainly, Lincoln emphasizes that the ancient world relied upon manpower and animal power to the neglect of the motive power of wind, water, and steam. Like Egypt, the American South was a slave power, neglectful of technology. Although beholden to the Massachusetts inventor Eli Whitney for the cotton gin, which was patented in 1794, the South was neither theoretically inclined nor mechanically minded. The Confederate Patent Office issued only 266 patents during the course of the war, as against more than 16,000 granted by the Union. The North surely had a genius for invention, but invention by itself is morally ambiguous, as can be seen in the career of Eli Whitney. Whitney's quest for efficiency reinvigorated the moribund plantation economy of the early 1800s, giving us King Cotton. But that same Eli Whitney was a pioneer in developing standardized interchangeable parts, which revolutionized industrial production in the North, in the North uh, northern factories, particularly armories, uh, thus playing a key role in the Union victory in the Civil War. Now, if it is the case that Lincoln gives us a history of technology through the Bible so that he can deliberately tell two stories at once, what does he hope to achieve thereby? Americans who had long believed that they were the new Israel might not welcome being told that they are really the new Egypt with their black slaves in the role of the chosen people of God. Now, the radical abolitionists frequently invoked this unflattering biblical parallel, but Lincoln had done so explicitly only once at the close of his Dred Scott speech. In this lecture, he proceeds by indirection avoiding vituperation and moral fervor, but dropping plenty of hints about God's punishment of Egypt. His horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The contrast between Lincoln's rhetoric and that of the abolitionist could not be more dramatic. The abolitionists loved to quote Isaiah, the prophet who, denounced, uh, who pronounced judgment upon all the nations with lines of terrifying vividness. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land darkened, and the people shall be as the fuel of the fire. No man shall spare his brother. Lincoln mentions Isaiah twice, but only to trace the first mention of ore and sails. His mode is the opposite of the moral harangue. It's oblique, it's evocative, inviting thoughtfulness and further examination. Again, for those who follow Lincoln's leads, the verses in Matthew 24 that immediately follow Lincoln's only New Testament quotation, those verses refer to a house divided. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, 
for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the goodman of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. It is with that implied warning at the end of the first lecture that Lincoln shifts to the second part of the lecture where he focuses directly and unmetaphorically upon the United States. So the second lecture begins. We have all heard of young America, he begins. He details how this personage, this most current youth, fares with respect to the specific arts, clothing, agriculture, transportation, that he had examined through scripture in the first part. Young America is a figure of consumerist luxury, wearing fabrics and enjoying delicacies brought from all over the globe. The Egyptian horses drowned in the Red Sea during the Exodus have been replaced by the iron horse, the railroad, panting and impatient to carry him everywhere in no time. Lincoln's tone has a satiric bite. Young America, it turns out, was a campaign slogan associated with his political rival, Stephen Douglas. Lincoln's riff on Young America and Manifest Destiny, another slogan belonging to the Democratic Party, becomes especially pointed when he alludes first to the Mexican War and then to American slavery. Here's what he says. Young America owns a large part of the world by right of possessing it and all the rest by right of wanting it and intending to have it. As Plato had for the immortality of the soul, so young America has a pleasing hope, a fond desire, a longing after territory. He has a great passion, a perfect rage for the new. He's anxious to fight for the liberation of enslaved nations and colonies, provided always they have land and have not any liking for his interference. That's the reference to the Mexican War. As for those who have no land, that would be the American slaves. As for those who have no land and would be glad of help from any quarter, he considers they can afford to wait a few hundred years longer. In knowledge, he's particularly rich. He knows all that can possibly be known and is the unquestioned inventor of manifest destiny. His horror is for all that is old, particularly old fogey. And if there be anything old which he can endure, it is only old whiskey and old tobacco. <laughs> After taking this partisan swipe at young America's hubris and hypocrisy, Lincoln immediately moves to higher ground, inquiring whether young America does indeed have the advantage over old fogey, and if so, what the great difference really is. Lincoln conducts his own version of the quarrel between the ancients and the moderns. He starts by returning to the mode of biblical exegesis, calling to the bar the first of all fogies, Father Adam. Examining that first of all inventions, the fig leaf apron, Lincoln shows that Adam had first to invent the art of invention, an art that depends on the prior habits of reflection and observation, habits which themselves depend upon the human faculty of speech. And speech, says Lincoln, does not appear to be an invention of man, but rather the direct gift of his creator. Even if it is, a human invention. Speech is only possible, says Lincoln, because of fixed biological features like the capacities of the tongue in the utterance of articulate sounds, capacities that Lincoln declares absolutely wonderful. Uh, he actually does a kind of experiment where he uh, figures out how quickly you can count from one to a hundred and how many distinct syllables and distinct sounds take place during those 40 seconds. Uh, Illustrating his meaning about human communicativeness and the role that it plays, Lincoln mischievously adds, this reminds me of what I passed unnoticed before, that the very first invention was a joint operation, Eve having shared with Adam in the getting up of the apron. And indeed, judging from the fact that sewing has come down to our times as woman's work, it's very probable she took the leading part. He perhaps doing no more than to stand by and uh, thread the needle. <laughs> Lincoln repeatedly reminds his audience, an audience inclined towards chauvinism of both the male and national varieties, 
of the humbling things that they might prefer to forget. Not only are human beings beholden to their natural endowment and their immediate fellows, including female fellows, there are intergenerational debts as well. The current generation is the beneficiary of the advances made by those very old fogies of earlier times. Along with Adam and Eve, Lincoln mentions Moses by name. He alludes to God's employment of writing in the Ten Commandments and the Holy Scriptures. And he suggests a humility-inducing thought experiment. Suppose the art of writing, with all conception of it, were this day lost to the world. How long, think you, before, would it be before young America could get up the letter A with any adequate notion of using it to advantage? It's Lincoln's Obama-esque, you didn't build that moment. <laughs> While he doesn't reduce the current generation to pygmies standing on the shoulders of giants, he does stress our position as privileged and rather complacent inheritors. Still, there is a modern difference. Improvements were achingly slow until the invention of printing, which Lincoln calls the other half, and in real utility, the better half of writing. Printing expands the field for invention, including political inventions like our Constitution. Because printing, he says, awakens in human beings the thought of rising to equality. Printing is the Emancipation Proclamation of the Mind. The final section of the speech pursues this question of modern superiority. Lincoln adds two more modern achievements, the discovery of America and the introduction of patent laws, both of which have played a role in vastly accelerating the rate of discovery and invention. In the midst of his genuinely appreciative account, Lincoln stops suddenly and says, though not apposite to my present purpose, it is but justice to the fruitfulness of this period to mention two other important events, the Lutheran Reformation in 1517 and still earlier, the invention of Negroes or the present mode of using them in 1434. Once again, the oddity of Lincoln's procedure is striking. He just drops in that ironical phrase, the invention of Negroes, and then resumes his appreciative consideration of printing. What are we to think now of the contrast between the ancients and the moderns? In the first lecture, we learned of the slave-holding Egyptians who never realized the power of steam. In the second lecture, we get the full steam ahead Americans who really have unleashed the intellect and, and, and energies of man, and yet have also contrived to turn other men into inventions. Lincoln has mentioned five modern events. Together, these five events provide a genealogy of the crisis of the house divided. The two seminal inventions of modernity presage the conflict. The invention of printing, 1436, that pointed humanity towards freedom. The invention of Negroes, 1434, created a new, more virulent form of slavery. The discovery of America, 1492, provided the ground on which those two forces, slavery and freedom, eventually converged. The Reformation, in 1517, added religious support for the cause of political liberty. Patent law, 1624, like the discovery of America, is ambiguous, double-edged. If the Negro is an invention, then that invention can presumably be patented, which is essentially what happened when the Royal African Company was granted exclusive rights to the slave trade in the 17th century, or when the cotton gin was invented and the southern states were refounded on what Lincoln in his sixth debate with Douglas called the cotton gin basis. We might with justice say that Lincoln's entire public career was devoted to disinventing the Negro or disinventing the present mode of using him. He sought to move the Negro from his status as an invention to his rightful status as a human being. Clearly, not every invention advances civilization. 
Lincoln concludes his speech by returning to the one invention he considers most efficacious for good, namely the printing press. He credits a technological advance with breaking the slavery of the mind. Slavery has been present throughout the speech. First, by implication, through the references to Pharaoh and Egypt, Moses and the children of Israel. Then, through the reference to enslaved nations and colonies in his denunciation of American expansionism. And finally, in that mordant line about the invention of Negroes. Now, at the very end of the speech, Lincoln shows that there is another aspect of slavery, an internal, a spiritual aspect. He unearths the deepest cause of slavery which turns out not to be political oppression, but rather ignorance, ignorance of one's human nature. Before the print revolution, the great mass of men were utterly unconscious, says Lincoln, that their conditions or their minds were capable of improvement. They not only looked upon the educated few as superior beings, but they supposed themselves to be naturally incapable of rising to equality. To emancipate the mind from this false and underestimate of itself is the great task which printing came into the world to perform. And yet, Lincoln indicates, technology by itself is insufficient since it only supplies the means of reading. The existence of printed matter doesn't guarantee literacy. For that, you need teachers. And teachers, Lincoln laments, have not been very numerous or very competent. America is dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal, but it is only through education and a certain kind of education that individuals actually become capable of rising to equality. Of course, we need training in the STEM fields, and yes, our regime is uniquely open to and encouraging of science, but we should not forget that applied science can underwrite slavery almost as easily as it can undergird liberty. We need civic education and liberal education, education that reminds Americans of the great difference between self-aggrandizement and self-government, between mastery of self and mastery over others. Education that promotes not only science and useful arts, but wisdom, Lincolnian wisdom, a wisdom that is Bible-infused though not strictly speaking, biblical. Thanks. Well, as the two talks are on slightly different topics, we've decided to have Q&A for the first talk before we hear the second talk. So we have a good five or so minutes uh, if you'd like to ask Professor Sharp any questions. Raise your hand, guy with his gentleman here. We don't have a, a tradition of getting student questions first? Um, not at Georgetown. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hi. Um, hi, Michael. I was, um, I've written on this very speech, so. I haven't read yours yet, so what, so, it, yeah, uh, what I, are you going to do to me? Yeah. No, I thought it was terrific. And, uh, but you know, I'm surprised at how differently we read the speech mm. in those same pretty short speech. Um, one of the differences is I just wanted to ask you about the way I took Lincoln's presentation of Egypt and mm. by contrast, the Hebrew people, um, was completely off the opposite of yours. Because it seemed to me that the Egyptians were the source of inventions and discoveries in the first half of the speech, whereas yeah. the Old Testament is merely the reporter of things that other people are doing. So it seemed as though it were, it were the people of the Bible who were not, I don't want to say not capable, that's too strong, but not doing the invention, inventing, but the Egyptians who were. Yeah, to, I mean, to some, ex, to some extent that's true. I mean, chariots and other things uh, are all first mentioned uh, in conjunction with Egypt. But it does say, I mean, he does end that by saying they never discovered, uh, I mean, they had the principle of steam power, but they never applied it to useful machinery. So I, I don't take them as simply representative of the force of technology. And, and I think this may indicate a difference between the way Lincoln is using the Bible and the way the Bible 
presents Egypt, because I think there's a very strong argument that that's how the Bible intend, what that intends Egypt to stand for. So it's also interesting that Lincoln never mentions the Tower of Babel. Uh, he leaves that out entirely. And it seems to me one reason that he might leave it out is because that story shows that God is maybe not as friendly to, <laughs> to speech uh, in particular. Uh, as, as Lincoln himself is. So that's why I say that this, the, the wisdom is Bible infused, but it's not precisely biblical. I mean, he, he's turning to the Bible for this account of the history of technology, but his, uh, I guess I would just say Lincoln is more receptive to technology than the, than the Bible is. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. Uh, although at the same time, I think he's not just completely endorsing the Baconian project. He is expressing these reservations uh, about our hubris and... I've got one question over there and one question over here. So, uh, gentlemen at the far end. Can you introduce if you want me to introduce myself? Uh, if you like, feel free. I'm Grady Stockman. I'm a, I'm a graduate. I'm Grady Stockman. I'm a graduate student in philosophy at Franciscan University of Steubenville. Mm -hmm. I just I just wanted to ask, how do you recommend we go about convincing our peers? of the value of the civic arts and the liberal arts? <laughs> well, um, read, uh, read Lincoln with them. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I, I, I do think it's hard just to, to make, make the case without actually engaging in the activity. Uh, but it's an uphill struggle. Thank you. And the gentleman here. Hello, uh, Ryan Schinkel, uh, yeah, master hi, student at St. John's College. Hello, Professor Schaub. Um, my question uh, is if you could expound uh, a little bit more on the patent clause. I believe he uh, says that it adds the uh, uh, yeah. fuel of interest to the fire of genius. Yeah, that last line, yeah. The and, fuel uh, adds the fuel of interest to the fire of genius. And I was wondering, in its connection to um, so the art of association, because the young American, he says, is you know, very singular and individual, looking for minds and very materialistic, but the patent clause mm -hmm brings together people uh, who would likewise, uh, who otherwise would never have uh, uh, been uh, putting their intellects together for useful products for other people. Yeah, yeah, this so he certainly stresses this, yeah, the, 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 the role of communication, right? So there are these personal habits of uh, observation and reflection, but then, you know, speech, writing, printing, those are all forms of communication and that speeds up this, uh, this process of discovery and invention. Um, yeah, again, uh, I mean, remember, he's the only president to, uh, to have a patent <laughs> for a device that would lift boats over shoals. He wanted to make the Sangamon <laughs> River more navigable. Uh, so he, uh, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's in favor of that patent clause. Uh, but I also think he recognizes that that's a pretty combustible uh, combination, putting the fire, uh, the fuel of interest with the fire of genius. And so through that line, you know, the invention of Negroes and the possible patentability of that invention, uh, I think he is raising some reservations. Uh, uh, interestingly, there's an, an, another speech, the uh, speech that Lincoln gave at uh, Edwardsville, Illinois, where he talks about uh, what, what Douglas, Stephen Douglas's particular discovery and invention were, and that's also a, uh, a, a, negative, a negative example. So yeah, he's in, he's in, he's in favor of patent laws, but uh, he recognizes that uh, we, we want to draw the line. We want to figure out what, what really can be patented and what shouldn't be patented, and this probably relates to... Uh, some of what Bill will be talking about. Which is a very nice segue. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Sharp. For your so it's um, my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Bill Hurlbert from Stanford University. He's an adjunct professor of neurobiology at the Stanford Medical School. After receiving his undergraduate medical training at Stanford, he completed postdoctoral studies in theology and medical ethics, studying with Robert Hamilton Kelly, the dean of the chapel at Stanford, and subsequently with the Reverend Louis Boyer of the Institut Catholique de Paris. In addition to teaching at Stanford, he has also worked with NASA on projects in astrobiology and was a member of the Chemical and Biological Warfare Working Group at the Center for International Security and Cooperation. 
So I hope you've washed your hands, Bill, since you've been here working at the... Uh, <laughs> And uh, from 2002 to 2009, he was a member of the President's Council on Bioethics. Together with, Diana. with Professor Sharp. Um, he serves as a trustee of the Templeton World Charities Foundation, is on the steering committee of the Templeton Religion Trust, and on the board of advisors of the John Templeton Foundation. So, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Bill Hope. <laughs> Thank you very much. So higher powers implies higher purposes. Higher purposes imply principles, origins, foundational questions of source and significance. Throughout the conference, we've heard a great deal about ideas, particularly spiritual ideas. And I want to, as we close here, this conference, I want to speak to you about the relationship to, uh, between ideas and their material means, their expression. And fundamentally, I want to speak with you about a new emerging biotechnological tool called CRISPR-Cas9, which is one of a range of new gene editing technologies, but an extremely powerful and extremely significant one. In fact, it's placed us at a veritable hinge of history, a crucial moment in the advances of biotechnology with enormous significance, great opportunities and great challenges, um, a kind of a crucial moment like Moses on the mountain. Here I set before you a blessing or a curse. More than ever, I think we need to, at this moment, acknowledge the higher powers, and here I mean the highest powers, because this technology is going to raise practical and theoretical questions of profound significance related to the sense of the creator, the creation, the moral coherence of existence, the purposes of existence, and its consummation, partly in relationship to technology. So a while back, I spoke at a conference at Harvard Editorial aspirations, and I thought this was worth showing you because it sort of sums up what I'm going to say. We're at an amazing moment. Human hands, Aristotle's tool of tools, the symbol of our distinctive bodily form and unique capacities of mind, our comprehension, creativity, and control. These hands are now reaching into the most fundamental forces of living nature. What an amazing creature we are. A new era of genomic engineering is emerging, and with it, a vast range of impacts on biotechnology as a whole and society as a whole. MIT Tech Review has called this the biggest biotech discovery of the century. CRISPR is an acronym. You'll see it there. Basically, it's a kind of immune system that's been, been grabbed by clever technologists to edit all, all a range of cells, all levels of living matter. Uh, I won't go into the scientific details, but it's extremely accurate, extremely easy to do and inexpensive. You can knock genes out, place new genes in, and control virtually every level of genomic operation. It's been called molecular scissors, but actually it's more like a Swiss army knife. And as I said, it's cheap, quick, and easy to use. It's swept through labs around the world very rapidly. There's been billions of dollars of investment in it. And just to give you an idea how powerful this is, I'll show you a picture of this guy later, but Rudolf Hienisch, who did the first transgenic mouse, told me it cost him 30 years ago $200,000, two years of a postdoc, and they could knock out one gene. And he told me that now they can do the same task for $2,000 in three weeks and knock out six or eight genes. So this is amazing, um, and it's going to escalate the advances at many levels very, very rapidly. Jennifer Doudna, who is the discover, discoverer of this new technology, the inventor, if you will, um, together with a, a, a European scientist named Emmanuel Charpentier. Uh, I'll show you a picture of Jennifer later. I'm working with her on a project of the ethics associated with this, but you can read these two quotes. You can see we're at a very significant moment. 
just to give you a very quick Cook's tour of what's possible here, we can alter genes to make more nutritious fruits. We can alter the process of soda photosynthesis. We can alter insects to, you've heard about eliminating Zika by altering insects through heritable changes. Not only that, we can operate beyond the genes at the RNA, which affects the production of proteins. So every level, new possibilities, new, new treatments of diseases, new agricultural products, new pharmaceuticals, and new inquiries into the foundations of development, human development, tracing the migration of cells in, during development from the very beginning through, and this is a hint of where I'm going, um, very positive possibilities in learning science, very problematic considerations from the perspective of ethics. One of my colleagues at Stanford said we should think carefully about where we're going to, how we're going to use this power. That's an understatement. It's been suggested that we use it to alter, dramatically alter, um, revise whole ecosystems. One time when I was leaving Jennifer Doudna's office after talking with her about our project, she said to me, you know, Bill, I, every once in a while I lie in bed at night and I think to myself, are we going to turn the whole world into one big GMO? It's a scary prospect. Um, here's a quote from a very nice guy, Kevin Isfeld. He's working on gene drives. You should look that up if you don't know what it means. But I took this because of his website. He's now taken this down. But earlier he had on it, talking about the kind of work he's doing with this, these gene editing tools. Broadly speaking, we seek to learn enough to rectify a fundamental flaw in our universe. Evolution has no moral compass. Well, does that mean the creation is just random and contingent? So his mentor, George Church at Harvard, has suggested we should work toward the de-extinction of our ancestral species, Neanderthals and Denisovans. Earlier, with gene editing tools, we've actually altered animals to put in firefly genes, if you will. Um, this was an art project. It didn't, probably didn't hurt the bunny. But now, with the new powers, it's just beyond our imagination at this point what's going to happen. I think it's very possible that your grandchildren, maybe your children, if you're young enough, or your grandchildren, will go to the zoo and see a whole new set of, of Dr. Zeus animals. Uh, huh? So, so uh, beyond that, new powers to create human-animal chimeric creatures. This is a drawing, okay, not a real thing, but it gives you some idea the kinds of projects this could be used for. And, and actually, there are many positive possibilities using chimeric creatures, so I'm not utterly against it. It's just that it's quite problematic. Obviously, as we venture into space, there's going to be be considerations of altering human beings so that they can adapt to the harsh circumstances of, of interplanetary travel and existence. Um, very, very, vibe, very serious field of inquiry. And then, of course, uh, addressing the perennial problems of human existence, not the least of which is aging itself, raising the fundamental question of is aging, its, is aging a disease? So this is stirred the excitement of a whole range of people uh, with a whole bunch of different agendas for what we're going to do with this, including the transhumanists. Their symbol is H+. Um, they include, they're an international intellectual and cultural movement advocating technologically mediated enhancement of human intellectual, physical, and psychological capacities, improved humans, H+. They argue that our advancing technologies offer us the opportunity to escape the constraints and cruelties of an amoral evolutionary process to lift humanity to the next level of personal social flourishing as genetically enhanced human-machine hybrid post-humans. So Francis Fukuyama served on the same council we did. And we address these issues. Others more frivolously, I think, suggest we just downsize human beings, make them smaller so they don't use as much resource. That's as humorous as I'll get this talk. The, this is Jennifer Doudna. She's a, a very serious and I think a very well-meaning, thoughtful scientist. 
And I'm really enjoying working with her. We're doing a project on the moral and social ethic, eth ethical issues associated with all this. And let me just very quickly lay out what some of the possibilities are. There are thousands of genetic, single gene genetic diseases that could theoretically be addressed with this technology, including in this case sickle cell anemia. Take the blood out, repair the hematopoietic stem cells, which generate the blood cells, something like three billion a minute are generated in your body, put them back in and generate normal cells. It's not as, quite as simple as that, but it holds very real possibilities for addressing this. There are, as I said, over 6,000 individual um, genetic diseases, single gene diseases, and 95% of them we have no, no, no treatment, not to mention cures. So for the first time in history, this looks re realistic in the, in the next decades. Not only that, but you can use viruses to, to bring these, this mechanism for gene transformation. You can use viruses as vehicles to deliver them in and alter um, organs as diverse as the, as the liver, the heart, and even targeted to specific brain tissues. Uh, vast numbers of very tragic circumstances could theoretically be addressed. Uh, this is a poor little fellow who has something called Miller's syndrome. Most genetic diseases manifest as syndromes because most genes don't do just one thing in the body, they address many systems. And so uh, this could be the way to cure something you could never do with targeted drug therapies directly. Here's another disease called Lesch-Nyhan's disease, very tragic disorder. The children usually die in their teens. They're missing a nutritional element and they actually chew their own fingers off. Um, but then what is this? That is obviously albinism. Is that a disease? Well, kind of and sort of not. I mean, it's got difficult things in the sunlight and skin cancer, but on the other hand, they live very good lives. And that raises, of course, the, the, the modern question of designer babies and intentions. What do we really want? What would we do if we could? And what would commercial outlets offer us by way of opportunities to alter not just our genes, but our personalities? So what do, you, what do we do as, as, a, as physicians, as a society? What do we endorse by way of both liberty and then questions of what, what medicine is for at, at all? So if you try to do this by defining disease, that's very difficult. Um, if you look back historically, and this relates to what, what Diana has laid out, do, do anybody know what disease this person had? Yeah, dra drapetomania from the Greek words meaning to run away, and of course the treatment was whipping. So that was a known, defined disorder in the text, medical textbooks of the antebellum South. So it just shows you what, what social ideologies can do, ideas can do within this realm of seemingly objective science. And of course we all know the tragic story of this and where it led to. Um, I'll return to that at the end. Of course, it was built on false science. It's not true that genetics is deterministic as it seems. On the other hand, genes do have significant power. And this is George Church, who I mentioned earlier. Maybe we turn the, the lights down so that you can see the slides better. Is that possible? Um, George Church has outlined a series of what he calls rare protective variants of large impact, which theoretically, if it was inexpensive and people accepted it, you could alter large numbers of these of people with these disorders and produce a whole range of advantages that he, he says would, would be widely useful in our species. A um, whole, whole bunch of things, resistance to viruses, leaner muscles, low odor, I don't know quite what that's about, but <laughs> anyway, um, he, he goes on to, to say, that, well, he doesn't think that that we should consider the gene editing any different than any other kind of you know, interventions in our body. He's a very, very interesting, very nice guy. I like him very much to talk to, but I think I disagree. I think we're now at the very foundational source. Interesting contrast to higher powers, but, more, but lower, if you will, or more fundamental forces operating. We are as a species for the first time in nearly four billion years of life on Earth, turning back with our hands, if you will, to alter living nature at its core, at its foundation. 
at its higher or lowest source, if you will. And Stuart Newman, among others, has warned us that it's opening this up is extremely problematic. Um, on the other hand, there's such compelling needs that it's not going to be easy to adjudicate this. And not only that, but there's, a, there's an increasing sense within our society that we ought to intervene because technology is the answer to all the things that are troubling us. Increasingly, we're turning to, to science and technological kind of science as the a solution as though life itself has an engineering solution rather than a spiritual one. The traditional role of medicine has been to cure disease and alleviate suffering, to restore and sustain the patient to a natural level of functioning and well-being. The medical arts were in the service of a wider reverence and respect for the order of the created world. This idea was put succinctly by Galen, the Roman physician, when he said the physician is only nature's assistant. But now with the powers of our advancing biotechnology, there's a new paradigm, one of liberation, technological transformation in the quest for happiness and human perfection. Grounded in the widespread practice and general acceptance of cosmetic surgery, slowly but steadily the scope and purpose of medicine are being extended along the gradients of our appetites and our desires and our, our unbridled ambitions, which is so even more dangerous. Increasingly, medicine is encompassing uh, realms of life not previously considered matters of health, but matters of natural human variation and limitation. In all these ways, we've revised the given frame of nature. And look at some of them. This is Rogaine, and the small print says here, if you're losing your hair, you no longer have a reason to lose hope. And that was, so that was run through doctor's offices until it was then accepted, and now you can get it at Costco. Uh, small stature, that's not necessarily a physiological problem at all, but it's a social problem. How do we define it? What do we say are the limits of human beings? Birth control pills, Viagra, all these various interventions, and yet, when you ask yourself, well, if it's all biologically grounded, why wouldn't we want to have healthier babies, more intelligent human beings, better brains, better personalities, dealing with things like crime, and of course, longevity itself. Uh, at the founding of the Society for Regenerative Medicine, William Hazeltine said the real goal is to pe keep people alive forever. And we all know the power of this, this material culture and its advertising forces and the temptations that are under um, very, very powerful forces. So don't underestimate where gene editing could take us. Uh, if you're interested, Diana and I were part of this. I think this is the best thing we produced as a, as a council. And I think it's well worth reading and really very relevant even more today than when we wrote it. But my main point is this is no longer science fiction. It's coming down on us very fast. It's very serious stuff. and. We, we all dread the, the kind of hyper-technological dimensions of hospital care, but we all know that human disorders, distress, struggle, suffering are very, very real. We all have desires for the good things of life, and we want to take seriously how to deal with this. And the scientists themselves have ranged to, to address these issues, but in a sort of very limited sort of way. Organized two years ago, a gene editing summit, and, but before the summit met, the two organizers, one my professor at Stanford, Paul Berg, Nobel laureate, said to address the complex de diseases like cancer, we must carry our investigations to the most fundamental levels, fundamental elements of living systems. So, so far I've talked about what nature is, the, what are the higher powers and the higher purposes embedded in nature, in the natural realm of things. Now we have to ask ourselves, well, even if we decide certain things are clearly targets for our, our interventions, what level will we go to find out information, essential knowledge to go forward? And this is where, among other things, among other places, the moral issues start to get very dense and troubling. So we must go to the most elemental levels of living systems. Where is that? That is at the embryo. 
And just before this conference, Chinese scientists announced they had modified human embryos. These were done on embryos that had disorders that could never have grown to full human expression. Nonetheless, they just, no, no global discussion of this, they just marched forward. And of course, many of you remember the, the, the terribly difficult time of the embryonic stem cells. It was the, the motivating moment for the founding of the President's Council in the first address by President Bush to the nation on August 9th, 2000, 2001, and then more or less buried by 9-11. Um, but now these issues are reemerging, kind of off the radar, surprisingly. George Daly, dean of the Harvard Medical School, points out that if we could just produce embryonic stem cells, they could act as models for testing drugs and other interventions. These are not the old-fashioned kind. These are genetically modified for more useful purposes. And there they are. And looking back over this, 2004, this, this was the the uh, cover story on my alumni magazine from Stanford Medical School, it was a caricature of science versus religion. Well, who's, who's got the higher powers here? Who's got the higher insights? Whose purposes are operating here? And are we gonna caricature the deepest sources of our understanding of the natural world and how we relate to it as co-creators within this, this realm of the material? So I, I wanna show you um, a, a this is a political ad, unless you think that the current environment is the worst you could get, just watch what, what was going on in 2006. Next summer, I'm going on a camping trip with my friends. On my way home, I'll be in a car accident and I'll be paralyzed for the rest of my life. In 20 years, I'll have Alzheimer's. I won't recognize my husband or my kids. Next week, my mommy and daddy are going to find out that I have diabetes. This is my congressman. Congressman John Sherwood. He voted against federal funding for stem cell research. Is he a doctor? Is he a scientist? Why did Congressman Sherwood bet my life that he knows best? Help me. Help me. Who knows? Maybe I'm your mother. Maybe I'm your grandson. Maybe I'm your little girl. How do you know I'm not you? Stem cell research could save lives. Maybe yours or your family's. Someone you love. Only Congressman Sherwood said no. How come he thinks he gets to decide who lives and who dies? Who is he? Majority action is responsible for the content of this advertising. So I'm not quite sure what happened. I'm going on a camping trip with I'm, my friends. I'm not sure what happened to home. poor old Congressman Sherwood, but it certainly, <laughs> certainly seems like a violent kind of politics to me. But I wanted to show you that because there, there is a coming collision between science and higher moral principle that is going to sweep us all into it in a way that make, will make the embryonic stem cell debates seem like mere prelude. Because, to put it succinctly, e everything that embryonic stem cell research promised was just very, very beginning as the transition between genomics, genetics, the, the sequencing of the human genome, the transition from that to actually figuring out, once we had the basic ingredients of developmental biology, how the genes and the proteins they produce and the interactions they govern produce the, the human organism. And the, the usefulness of this new tool with CRISPR is to knock genes out, see what they did, put new forms of genes in to see what they do, clone embryos in standardized batches to allow standardized changes to to different batches of embryos to see how they respond to pharmaceuticals, and an endless series of possible experiments, every one of which could use hundreds of embryos. The missing link right now is the, the lack of eggs, but that will be almost certainly solved. They've produced a f fertile mice from egg and sperm developed in a lab, and they're working furiously to get that 
done in human beings. And so we're looking at the possibility of not just even hundreds and thousands of embryos, millions of embryos as a resource for biomedical science. I, I, there was a lot more I wanted to show you in this, um, and I would have been able to do a little bit more if we hadn't slowed down here, but just look at the slides as you go and ask yourselves, how, where, what are the foundational principles and the higher powers that we're going to align ourselves with as we go forward? And the, f the fundamental problem we're gonna face is that we're, there's gonna be a cost of conscience. There will be exclusion, there will be a kind of intolerance of attitudes. Those who want to follow what I consider to be higher moral principles in this regard are going to have to forego some of the advantages. I don't think that will include living forever, but who knows. But you definitely will have to say that science should not just go forward without deeper principles governing it. And I, there were four basic questions I wanted to raise to you, and these go back to the embryonic stem cell debates. If we endorse the use of embryos, for what, what else will we use them for besides embryonic stem cells, studying early development, for example? And will we allow the creation of human embryos? Well, they already do this in, in um, the United Kingdom for research purposes. That's Rudolf Janisch, his first mouse he made. Um, and George Daly, again, says there's some things we'd have to study embryos to get the information from. And then, in which case, how many embryos is it okay to use for research? And as, as I Im Im implied, cloned embryos in great quantities would be the ideal way to go, and we can now clone human embryos. And eggs, well, where will we get them? By converting embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells to make eggs. And, and as uh, Davos Salter says, eventually we might use thousands of em embryos, they, but how would we react to them? Well, they'd become just another type of cell line, they'd become objects, and they'd be used as objects. Um, we'd be used 20,000 embryos and we'd say, oh, well, that's okay. Um, and then finally the question is how long would we allow them to be used? And there we face the problem that embryonic stem cell research has been useful scientifically if you take away the moral questions, induced pluripotent stem cells, we've learned a lot, but the question is wouldn't we like to understand development all the way up through the process and in which case how long will we allow embryos to gestate and would we actually put them into artificial wombs or even into human wombs. After all, they were gonna die anyway, remember? So we've really got a challenge in the United Kingdom. They're already talking about revisiting the 14-day rule, advancing it to 28 days. And so we've got a serious set of, of moral issues coming. And I just wanna close with a couple of slides um, that outline a couple of points here. So Erwin, Chargoff, a Columbia scientist, who was a thoughtful guy, he was very crucial in some of the early genetic discoveries. He, he saw this coming. He said, science is now the craft of the manipulation, substitution, and deflection of the forces of nature. What I see coming is a giant slaughterhouse in Auschwitz in which valuable enzymes, hormones, and so on will be extracted instead of gold teeth. Genetically modify embryos, grow them for a while, take cells, tissues, and even organs. There are some people who advocate the cloning, implantation, and harvesting of human embryos up to six months to, for purposes of cure. So we start with a very small premise that suffering is the greatest evil of all, and that science, that embryos don't count because you can barely see them. We accept the premise that size is a moral, is a measure of moral meaning, somehow a strange aberrational perception. And we end up places we never wanted to go. What is madness? It's to have erroneous perceptions and reason correctly from them. That's where I'm afraid we're heading. For those of you who have not reflected on this, I suggest you start to do so. It's coming down on us very rapidly great temptations, 
but also great opportunities for good. Morally contained, this will be an extraordinary moment, wonderful moment. Not morally contained, it'll be the, be the, final, the final crucifixion of Christ. C.S. Lewis once said, we should, we should answer all of our problems with more love, not less love. I would suggest that's the higher power that ought to govern this technology. We return to the hands, if we acknowledge the source and significance of our lives and recognize the power of love, we'll do very well with our technology. Otherwise, we've got a tragedy ahead. Hi, thank you uh, both for your, um, your presentations. I'm, I'm Ben Story from Furman University. Dave, I'd like to ask, uh, I think, both Diane and Bill to, to, to put your, um, the questions that you've raised for us in the context of some larger questions that have been raised by the, by the conference. Um, I, I'll put these questions in terms of the presentation uh, given this afternoon by Marianne Glendon, which is an argument for uh, resuscitation of the, of the language of human rights let's talk about rightless language generally, in what she recognizes as a situation of great decay and politicization of that language, the, uh, to the point at which it doesn't seem to provide much common ground anymore. And yesterday's presentation by Alistair McIntyre arguing for the reviving of the language of, of the common good, of the human good, in a, in a sense as an alternative to the language of rights, a uh, means of which to adjudicate are these kinds of these dilemmas and many other dilemmas. And so the question that I want to ask both of you is with respect to the, the, the dilemmas posed to us by these and, and many other technological questions, are these, are these dilemmas best addressed by the language of rights, the language of the good, or, or some combination of them? Go ahead. Yeah, um, well, I think actually that rights language still has a lot of promise and that rights language was sufficient to address the problem posed by the invention of the Negro and that rights language is sufficient to address the problems raised by the invention of the embryo. Yeah, language belongs to the invention. Oh, okay. Let me start over. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think there's a, a, a lot of potentiality in rights language still, and that rights language proves sufficient to uh, address the, uh, the problem raised by the invention of the Negro, and that rights language is sufficient to address uh, the problems raised by the invention of the embryo, the invention of the Negro, the invention of the embryo. Uh, and that really is just who counts as a member of the human family, uh, answering that question. Uh, but on the enhancement stuff, which you also referred to, there it seems to me rights language might not be sufficient, and there you need to have a richer conception of the of the human good. So both. we don't we don't yeah both. <laughs> yeah, you know, just to go on what Diana just said, John's John's colleague at Georgetown, Alfonso Gomez Lopez, used to very often say. Let's not use the term the embryo because it dehumanizes and, and it, it puts it into a sort of a separate human category. And, and I think that's very powerful. As to rights, well, I'm, I'm a, a physician, not a political scientist, but I will say this, it's disturbing to live in Silicon Valley at some level because, you know, California, if you're not three-fourths libertarian, you just don't belong there. And, and the idea that, that we have these absolute rights over ourselves, is, it's kind of what you get when you don't have a notion of higher powers and higher purposes. You, who do you belong to? You, the, the evolutionary process? And, and if that's it, then why shouldn't you do what, what uh, Google has done, put a billion dollars into Calico, the California life company, to try to to solve the question of aging. And not only that, but all sorts of personal ambitions and 
appetites and indulgences, why not? It, it's a very, very difficult question what, where the individual rights collide with the, the larger externalities of living in a civilized society with a, with a hopeful fundamental set of assumptions about what life is for. I mean, in the final end, this comes down to what we perceive to be the source and significance of life itself. I have a question back here, and then we'll get yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, I'm going to go ahead, and then we'll... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Th yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for this interesting uh, session and bringing up these... Uh, it was really interesting to have the perspective of a uh, physician taking up um, these questions. Uh, I'm Kichar Guna. I'm a PhD candidate in philosophy at Cornell. Um, I guess I have a little bit of uh, pushback, and I hope it doesn't come across as too critical. Um, but in the last talk, I feel like you covered a very impressive amount of ground in terms of the issues you raised, uh, from you know GMOs to um, birth control to cloning, uh, stem cell research. And I'm wondering whether there really is a unified kind of problem and uh, perspective to be taken here. Um, these seem like such different things to me, both um, materially and ethically. Uh, I guess I'm not, you know, I'm a lot more worried about stem cell research than I am about GMOs. Um, I don't really think that doing gene editing on our food seems particularly worrisome or offensive to God or anything like that, so I don't know what you think about that. Um, and maybe this is a good concluding question as we um, kind of wrap up this conference, but you know, I think some of us are very on board with uh, clearly this um, interrogation and focus on higher powers, but I guess going back to my secular university where most of my peers and colleagues don't believe in God or aren't particularly religious, I'm not really sure what kind of like secular philosophical arguments I can I can give them here. What university is that? Cornell. Okay, so which is by the way one of the source universities for the whole concept of science, technology, and society studies. Um, I I did not mean in dancing across these issues like GMOs to be utterly condemning technological interventions against nature. There's a great quote from John Stuart Mill that's something to the effect of if, if you look at nature, you can't help but believe that whoever the source of nature is, that it's, it was intended as a scheme to be remediated. Not, you know, that's the essence of the quote. And I am a doctor, after all. So I don't just say, oh, wait, wait, sorry, you got cancer, that's nature. I, I, I just was trying to make the point that there is something mysterious operating in the natural world, and I think most of us feel it, if not, if not scientifically, we feel it aesthetically, that there is some sort of, I feel, there's some sort of beauty and beneficence that still, there's a, a, a sort of radiance of divine glory. Still, so we just do not want to treat casually as though all of living nature is mere matter and information to be reshuffled and reassigned for projects of the human will. That was my point in saying that I just didn't have enough time to get into the nuanced territory, and I did want to cover the fact that there are questions here about what we do with the natural world, quite apart from the human world, and that there are questions of social community that we will suffer. The cost of conscience is going to be not being able to do some things that we might like to do individually for our advantages, but they're just not morally acceptable within a community. But that finally, there are these very profound questions about about the origins of human life in its most fundamental form. And after great struggle in this process of deliberating on embryonic stem cells, I, I just arrived, at, my background is not Catholic, but my Catholic, my Catholic colleagues informed me of, of thoughts that I had not, never entertained. You, you know, when you teach, you can just ask questions, you don't have to answer things. And, <laughs> and, and um, I finally came to the conclusion that that there is a very big difference between living nature and the rest of our ideas about things. Um, we have an assembly line notion of embryonic development right now, but it's not true to the biology itself. In biology, living things, the whole precedes and produces the parts. And if you don't, if you don't, uh, as Richard Dorflinger is known to say, it's not, uh, what is your quote about potential um, not a potential being, but a being with potential. It's a good, good summary of it. 
So yes, I mean, I, I'm sorry if it seems superficial and critical at too many levels, but I just wanted to make the point that there are going to be costs to conscience here. But just one final point on that for me, and you should have something more to say. I, I think in the final end it's the problem of suffering that we're going to address. And there, there as a physician, I, suffering in a, in a collision of cultures like we've experienced in the last 300 years, but most intensely in the last 50 or so, when you have the, con the collision of cultures and pluralism to just try to get along, you tend to sink down to, to certain premises that will, will allow people to agree on things. And one of those seems to be that suffering is bad. Well, I'm against suffering, but I'm not against all means to overcome suffering. And as a physician, especially as a Christian physician, I believe it's my role to overcome suffering in the context of love and that it never violate love in the process of trying to, to, to solve a problem and recognize also that, that suffering is not the absolute ultimate of evils. It is it's an expression of f the fallen reality, but it is also a, has a redemptive power in certain contexts. We do everything we can to solve suffering in a moral way, to express love, but we don't override love to, to solve suffering. Okay, now, um, I don't want to prolong the session much longer, but I sense there are a number of people who would like to ask questions. So what I'm going to do is to ask, uh, ask people to put their hand up if they'd like to ask a question. We have one, two, three, four. I know, that's why I've got my eye on the clock. And I'm going to simply to ask you to ask your question. Those who want to go, are free to go, of course, but uh, if I want people to have the opportunity to ask their question, and then I'll simply ask each of our speakers may be to reply to whichever question they'd like to. Uh, briefly. So if you could briefly state your question, preferably in one sentence. And then everybody's heard what you have to say, and we'll invite our speakers to reply to one or more of them. So, the first hand we had over here. Right, quick question, one sentence. Don't be a mic, just shout out loud. Um, thank you. Um, uh, historically, it seemed that uh, the Catholic response to questions of this nature would be to not necessarily have to appeal to the highest power, God, but you could also appeal to the level of human nature, nature in general, to, to answer some of these questions. So it seems uh, my question would be, is it possible in these sorts of questions, or do we have to go all the way to the highest power? Okay. Yes? My question is just, what does the medical profession today think about these things? So how, how are doctors on the whole thinking about these sorts of things? Right, thank you. And going along. Yes. Oh, thank you very much. My question is, I am actually a theoretical scientist, so I'm not as in tune with just the specific biological questions, but my question is, in the broader scope of teaching the models and theories of uh, scientific understanding, how can we go forward trying to introduce this nuance of meaning and ethical perspective into our thinking about scientific models? Hi, Mark Brown, good to see you folks. Um, variation on the first question, I guess. It seems like the whole conference is rotating around this question of we can't go to reveal religion as a solution to some of these societal problems. We have, we're you know, in the realm of philosophy or natural theology, potentially. And, and I guess the question really is, what are, the, what are the arguments from human reason alone that would allow you to make a case, for example, for the acceptance of suffering or human limitation, the kinds of things that we're we're struggling with because I think we all agree that we're not going to win on a sort of a purely theological debate. Before I pass on to our speakers, might I just answer actually some of the questions all relating to this issue of how, you know, in a secular world, how do we? Um, Alfonso Gomez Lobo, my former dear colleague at Georgetown, produced two wonderful little books before he died. One's called Morality and the Human Goods, an introduction to natural ethics, and later Bioethics of the Human Goods. An introduction to natural law bioethics, which was they're both published by Georgetown University Press, and the latter has just been translated into Spanish and we're published in Santiago in a couple of weeks. So great little books, great little introductions to natural law philosophy and application to these sorts of questions, and then they contain also further recommendations for reading. So uh, you may want to look at Professor Gomez Lobo's books. Over to you, Bill and Diana, would you like to uh, yeah, just, briefly just, answer just, whatever you like? Yeah, very quickly the very quickly, the first one, uh, 
first one and the fourth one about uh, human nature. Uh, yes, yeah, so I think Lincoln is uh, a good example for us here. I mean, he turns to biblical exegesis to discover sobering truths about the nature of the human being that anthropology then informs his analysis of both the potentials uh, and the great dangers of science and technology for human beings who are inevitably politically situated. Uh, so uh, there's, a, there's another line from Lincoln where he says, the Bible tells us somewhere that men are desperately selfish. And he says, uh, I think we might have discovered that on our own. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, there are there are truths which you can turn from the, to the Bible, but uh, reason may be another route to some of some of those truths at least. Well, I guess I can second that. Um, and as far as reason, I suggest instead of hearing from somebody inadequately equipped to answer that, you talk to Kevin Flannery. Um, I. I do think that there is something evident, as I said a minute ago, something evident in the nature of things that should help guide us. I put that quote in by Kevin Estelle just at the last minute for delivering my comments because the idea that nature has a fundamental flaw, evolution is amoral, has a, no, no, has a fundamental flaw, I don't think that's quite true. I, I think there is something self-evident in the world. I mean, Paul seemed to think so that can clearly be seen as evident in the creation and the eternal power and deity. I, I, I'm inclined to think that, but I don't know if that counts as human reason or just whatever it is, but it does, it's very real to me anyway. And that's for the questions about science and, and uh, how we get the scientific community and ourselves ripped up in these difficult questions. I, I would say that I've spent, spent my entire professional life trying to, trying to do that and with with, I think, in, increasing attentiveness to these issues. Um, I, I'm not critical of my scientific colleagues at Stanford. I, I, for the most part, they are very earnest. They just have a different kind of core strength set and way of thinking. And I think we need to increase the dialogue between various disciplines in order to get there. And I'll tell you, this is a final comment for me. I'm actually very encouraged by this because with CRISPR-Cas9, which is the technology I was mainly revolving my talk around. It is so dramatic and so powerful that for the first time in 40 years of, of being involved in this field, my colleagues are coming to me saying, uh-oh, this is getting scary. So I would suggest you take it very seriously and increasingly engage people from all, all levels. And just one final moment on that. I'm, I don't describe myself as a bioethicist because I think it's kind of a strange ersatz profession, per se. It's, it's sort of a self-appointed priesthood. You know? <laughs> it's sort of like saying, well, we know the final answer is everything. I think bioethics is a conversation for the whole human family, not a profession. And in that sense, we really need the voices of the people that are going to be impacted by these technologies. And more so than ever, with, with germline genetic engineering, which doesn't just treat the patient in front of you, but affects the whole future of the, the lineage of that individual and presumably the whole species. And I, it's coming. I, know I think you're going to be surprised how soon you're going to read about it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.